So can you see my screen now? Yes. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. So good evening, everyone. I'm here to speak about RSPB's work um, in the Greater Gola landscape in West Africa, where we have been looking um, at ways to maximize benefits for community livelihoods, for biodiversity and for carbon by engaging farmers in the area um, in cocoa agroforestry. So just to give you a bit of background on, of the landscape where we work. So the Gola forest straddles uh, the border between Sierra Leone and Liberia. And you will see in the map on your left where Sierra Leone and Liberia um, lie. They are the country- Shashi, I think your screen's frozen. We, um, we're still on the first page. Ooh. So let's see if I can share mine. Yes. Uh, please. Yes, yeah, so if you stop sharing and I'll start. Okay. Sorry about that. As, as with it, with everything, it was working five minutes ago. <laughs> yes, that's right, yeah. So I should come out of that. That's very strange. Okay, so we're now on the uh, the map. Second slide, yeah. Okay. So if you see on your map, just give me a minute, yeah. I'm trying to get it on my screen. Technical hmm. problem. Okay. So if you see it on 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 the map, you will see. Sorry, I'm just going to take a minute to just find it on my screen because it's just I can't see what I'm looking at. Hmm. Just to be right. So on your screen, you'll see the map of um, of West Africa, and and uh, you'll see Sierra Leone and Liberia west of the Gulf of Guinea, and um, so the Greater Gola landscape where we work is represented by several national parks and forest reserves, and that's the map in green that you see. Um, in Sierra Leone, it is represented. Um, it comprises the Gola Rainforest National Park, um, the two blocks of forest that you see on, on the map, and the, um, and the buffer area, which is in light green. And in Liberia, it is represented by the Gola Forest National Park, the uh, foyer proposed protected area, and the adjoining community forest around these two, um, the National Park and the Forest Reserve. Um, so the next slide then, more recently, uh, we have included the Kambui Hills Forest Reserve uh, as part of the Greater Gola landscape. And um, together, the whole area uh, co covers an area of about 350,000 hectares. And this is two times the size of Greater London. So Greater London is, covers an area of about 150,000 hectares. Um, next, so it is a large area that we are we work in. So just to give you an idea, this is what some of the forest looks like uh, on the ground. So Gola rainforest is the largest remaining remnant of the Upper Guinea uh, tropical forest, and it is one of the top thirty-five biodiversity hotspots in the world. So we're very proud to be working in the area and. This is definitely a forest that we want to try to conserve. Next. So in terms of uh, biodiversity, um, it supports more than 300 species of birds, um, more than 600 species of butterflies compared to 59 in the United Kingdom, 75 species of mammals, half of which are larger mammals like elephants, uh, 56 species of amphibians and reptiles, and 31 species, uh, species of fish. So very important for biodiversity. Next, please. There are several threatened and vulnerable species within Gola, including uh, the Western chimpanzee, which is critically endangered. We have the pygmy hippo, 
the forest elephant and the white-necked uh, picathartis, which is a bird that's quite endemic to these um, areas in West Africa. Next, please. Yeah, so the RSPB support for GOLA sits within a broader program of work, namely the Red Plus program, which is reducing emissions from deforestation and degradation of forest. And we are very proud that this is the first Red Plus project um, in West Africa. Next. There are three main areas of work in the Red Plus program, which uh, help facilitate a net positive benefit for climate. The first is um, the strengthening of the conservation and effective management of the Gola Rainforest National Park in Sierra Leone. Next. So secondly, um, we work to ensure the sustainable management of the, national, the natural resources around the national park. And this is really to enable the local people to become environmental stewards of the natural resource that's found in the area that underpins their livelihoods. And this program is, is um, implemented through education, capacity building, land use plan uh, planning and activities that enhance the social and economic benefits um, of forest and the agricultural land in the area. Next. The third component is uh, research and monitoring. And this is really to collect information on the social and biodiversity aspects of, of the area to ensure that we have accurate, relevant, and timely information for the management of, of the entire area. Next. In Sierra Leone, the Red Plus program is implemented through a partnership. This is between the government of Sierra Leone the Conservation Society of Sierra Leone, which is the bird life uh, partner in country, um, and, com and community elected um, representatives, sorry, representatives, and of course the RSPB, and we and this is done through the uh, an organisation called the Rainforest uh, Gola Rainforest Conservation Limited by Guarantee, which is a non profit organisation or GRC for short. Next. So the Gola Rainforest National Park is an area of about 70,000 hectares. And this helps us to reduce global carbon emissions by about 700,000 tons annually. The area also supports 122 forest edge communities. Um, you will see the red dots on the map. And these are the villages dotted around the national park that we work with. And the activities that we do with the communities include um, savings and loan schemes, education and awareness programs. Um, and we also provide agricultural support for farmers, um, including cocoa. And the cocoa program is carried out outside of the protected area um, in the four kilometer buffer of the national park. Next. So why COCO? Why are we working with COCO? I mean, a lot of people say that we are a conservation organization. We should be focused on biodiversity. Um, so there are several reasons why we work with, uh, with COCO. The first is that COCO had been a major export of Sierra Leone in the 1980s. So there was familiarity with working with COCO in the country and with the farmers in the Gola landscape. Um, much of the infrastructure was also there in place, um, even if, you know, through the war, the, through the long period of civil war, some of the skills and knowledge for uh, cocoa planting of cocoa production had been lost, but there was still a lot of um, infrastructure. Um, from a biodiversity point of view, cocoa is a shade tolerant crop, which makes it a good crop for agroforestry and for biodiversity. There was also a desire from the forest edge communities to work with cocoa as their parents and grandparents had themselves been cocoa farmers. So it was seen to be a, a good thing to be working with cocoa. And lastly, um, there was still a good, a good demand for, for cocoa, for more cocoa globally. 
and the cocoa from Gola could feed into this niche uh, market that we were looking at. Next. So just to give you a bit of background about the world of cocoa, um, cocoa supply, the, the global supply for cocoa comes from three regions, South America, Southeast Asia, and West Africa. And West Africa provides more than 70% of the global, global cocoa supply. This comes mostly from Ghana and um, Ivory Coast. So the demand for global cocoa has been on, on the rise for a, for a while, about 1% growth uh, annually. Um, and also we noticed that cocoa is expanding in sub-Sahara Africa uh, by about 130,000 hectares annually. Um, but in most of these areas, sun-tolerant cocoa tree varieties have been used. And this, of course, poses a threat to forested areas. Um, the other important fact is that more than 90% of cocoa that is being produced in the world come from smallholder producers. Next. So bearing these facts in mind, the RSPB embarked on a program to help develop uh, Gola forest friendly cocoa, which is guided by three um, by triple by the triple win standards, which is that it needs to provide benefits for farmers and improve their livelihoods. It needs to create a forest like habitat for habitat for wildlife to support biodiversity, and it needs to satisfy consumer confidence in a sustainable product. So we are currently working to define these standards for the Gola cocoa farmers, and we're also initiating work to design and pilot agroforestry, uh, cocoa agroforestry models that hit this sweet spot of maximizing livelihoods, biodiversity, and carbon benefits. And the hope is that once we get the right models, we will then look to upscale these models across the landscape. Next. The Gola Cocoa program currently supports um, the entire cocoa value chain that is from, from the tree or the, the cocoa bean to the production of chocolate bars. It helps communities establish nurseries, for example, rehabilitate uh, cocoa farms, um, and also provides farmers with the right equipment. Um, for example, mats and baskets are provided to ensure that there's proper fermenting and drying of cocoa in the villages. There are central, centralized collection centers um, for storing cocoa in the villages. And once, they are, once the cocoa is brought to a larger warehouse in the town, it is then sorted and fumigated against diseases. So while cocoa... Um, in Gola is organic by default. There's no absolutely no fertilizer that's used in the in the in the planting of the trees and production of the cocoa. Um, farmers are currently looking to satisfy requirements for formal organic certification, um, and in addition to that, we provide uh, support to the farmer associations for the export of cocoa beans to international markets in Europe and America. Next. So the cocoa value chain, the Gola cocoa value chain has been active since 2015, so about seven years now. And we are now engaging more than 2000 uh, registered smallholder farmers. There are currently three farmer associations and a fourth one will be soon, will be formed very soon. And they operate with the Ngolia Gobu Cocoa Farmers Union, which is fair trade certified. To date, farmers have exported more than 100 metric tons of cocoa beans. And we're also producing, uh, we're also providing training on agroforestry, governance uh, of the farmer associations, business management, and safeguarding. Next. So to support the production of Gola chocolate bars, the RSPB collaborated with the chocolate maker in the UK maybe about three years ago to produce chocolate bars that are sold through our shops and reserves. There's uh, Gola Coco is also used in other products in Europe, America, Japan, New Zealand, as, um, and the cocoa beans are also sold in these countries. 
So more recently, um, we've been supporting uh, the production of chocolate bars in Sierra Leone, and these bars are also being sold um, in the country where they are produced. Next. So what next then uh, for the Gola Coco program? We're looking firstly to expand the Coco program to enable the participation of more farmers in the landscape, so maybe to about 3,000 farmers. Um, we're also looking to define the forest friendly standards more clearly and to publicize and to highlight the Gola Coco farmers story. Um, thirdly, we're also looking to improve market access for Gola cocoa beans. Um, to increase the chocolate making in Sierra Leone and to diversify the products from Sierra Leone. And lastly, um, to replicate these forest friendly standards to other landscapes in Liberia and other, you know, other sites in Africa and other parts of the world. Next. So I've included here some useful links that you might want to look at to get more information about um, the Red Plus program. Um, and also the uh, COCO program that we have in West Africa. Thank you very much. Thank you, Shashi. That's really interesting. Um, I'll be um, I'll be sharing this presentation with, if, that, if it's okay, I'll share the presentation with everybody that booked um, via a, a Google Drive link, so you'll be able to download and and, and look at obviously all the links, but also the the um, facts and figures if they're, if they're useful to you. Um, we, we're going to have a Q&A for both of our speakers at the end, um, but if anybody's got anything pressing that they want to ask, then then please put your hand up now. Otherwise, I'll, I'll hand over to uh, Lazarus and we'll, we'll start our, um, our second part of the presentation. Uh, so we're moving away now from West Africa and moving to East Africa, um, to Uganda, and moving away from cocoa to, to coffee. Um, so. Welcome, Lazarus. Good to see you. Hello. Uh Good evening, everyone. M my name is Lazarus, and I'm glad to be here. Uh, I'm joining the call with uh, my colleague. He's going to introduce himself, and we have a brief presentation to make to you about what we are doing in Uganda. Peter. Okay. Uh, thank you, Lazarus. Thank you, everyone uh, on board. Thank you for this meeting. I'm indeed Peter Marahi, uh, working with the, the communities here in Uganda. Uh, and this is particularly in Ibundivujo district on the slopes of uh, the mountains of Mount Renzori. Back to you, Lazarus. All right. Uh... Somehow my screen is not showing, so I think probably I'll have to work with the presentation I have here. Yes, uh, so in Uganda, what we are doing is we are promoting a bad friendly certification, organic certification and fair trade. And we're working with uh, two cooperatives in this district of Uganda, which borders with the DR Congo. One is called the Buka Buendera Farmers Cooperative Society Limited, which deals uh, in coffee. And in terms of, uh, it's a young cooperative that started in 2017. And generally it's growing with a membership of uh, around 607 uh, producer farmers who've come together with uh, currently they are organic certified and with a production capacity of around 327 metric tons. They haven't exported yet, but there's a, a lot of potential that they have, which we think through uh, the new certifications like bad friendly certification, we should be able to harness. Next slide. Uh, then the, the other cooperative we are working with in this region is uh, called Bondika Kemba Growers Cooperative Society Limited. Uh, this started 
in 2012, but was officially registered in 2014. Fortunately, it's already fair trade and organic certified, and they have been into exporting cocoa to uh, Europe, most importantly, uh, Germany. And previously, they have been ex also exporting to Italy. And they equally have potential. We haven't gone a step ahead to do processing, but uh, much of the effort that has been put into this uh, cooperative has been to form the cooperative, uh, train it in group governance, uh, good agricultural practices, and also support the cooperative in terms of uh, increasing one, the membership, but also increasing shareholding and also increasing its operational capacity. So what are we doing in terms of helping this cooperative? Next slide. What are we doing in terms of helping this cooperative become uh, bad friendly certified? Bad friendly certification is a certification scheme that uh, focuses on a standard that promotes coexistence uh, between birds and communities where uh, a, a commodity like, for example, coffee is grown. So it looks at having biodiversity in terms of the plant species, which should be able to support a number of other bird species to be welcomed to live amongst the enterprises. So promotes agroforestry, but also protection of the environment, making sure that the environment under which the commodity is being grown or the crop is being grown, in this case, coffee and cocoa is friendly to the occupation of the birds. What's unique about this area where we are operating is that the, both of the two communities, if you would see on the map, uh, are all found on the Renzori Mountains, which is a UNESCO, a UNESCO World Heritage Ramsar site. And Currently, it boasts over, with over 217 birds. Uh, a number of apes, mountain gorillas, elephants, and other bird, uh, bird and animal species. Actually, it's the only mountain where you can find a three-horned chameleon. So wonderful sights to see. And most other importantly is that it has uh, glaciers onto it besides being located a few degrees above the equator, just, just above the equator. So it's a quite uh, a unique place we are working in and we think we have an, a role to play in terms of contributing to the protection of this uh, unique environment. So our farmers have been living in around this mountain for over a century and have tried to make sure they protect it besides the challenges they're facing. This mountain for quite a time was known as the mountains of the moon and it's a known to be the source of the river Nile, the great river Nile. Next slide. Why are we again promoting bad friendly certification? Of late we've seen a climate change affect the communities where coffee is being produced, given the fact that the landscape where these farmers are found is hilly and being that they stay on the slopes of the Renzori mountain. We've seen mud slides due to torrential rains. In 2019, it was more serious. So we are promoting bird friendly certification as a one way to promote agroforestry so that we can be able to regulate uh, the microclimatic conditions under which first and foremost, the crop is grown, but also we know that the trees trees have a role to play in stabilizing the soil on sloppy areas so that we can start to reduce the impacts of uh, torrential rains on having mudslides. So bird friendly certification, besides it being a certification scheme that would promote coexistence of birds, it would also contribute a lot to the stability of the land and also contribute a lot to protecting livelihoods in terms of protecting them against mudslides, which like, for example, in 2019 claimed about, 20, about 53 
lives. Next slide. Again, we anticipate and hope that like any other certification scheme usually, uh, but friendly certification comes with uh, premiums. So we are sure that once we get certified, we should be able to see premiums coming in to help these communities support uh, their children, go to school, probably do community projects like uh, establishing schools. We know that for where already organic certification is happening and fair trade certification is being, uh, is being practiced, we've seen parents get increased incomes that have managed to help them send their children to school. We've also seen a movement that is supporting girl child education where the producers are self-mobilizing, not relying on aid, but using their own income to send their children to school and keep them in school. So we think bad friendly certification will promote besides the environmental protection role will also contribute to this. Next slide. Uh, we are already progressing. For example, there is a stakeholder event that we held uh, in February 2021, which was involving uh, stakeholder, multiple stakeholders, including uh, presenters from uh, the Smithsonian Migratory Bird Center, which is currently uh, this, the, the body that does the certification for bird friendly certification. We already know that currently it's only coffee that has a certification standard that's approved and being practiced. So we are working with the, the Smithsonian Migratory Bird Center to see if we can become part of the pilot project that will develop a standard for bird friendly certification under COCO. Uh, I personally participated in a pre-audit exercise and shared with a, a team at the Smithsonian Migratory Bird Center. And they told us that already the results we have in terms of canopy are promising. And so we are quite certain that if we invested more effort, more resources into this, the farmers should be able to reap the benefits. And then we have seen that the two cooperatives after attaining organic certification are now starting to practice more of the agroforestry, but we also know that uh, organic certification is a pre-qualification for becoming bird friendly certified. So we already are making positive strides towards being a bird friendly certified, which like I have already highlighted before, we know its benefits will definitely spread to other areas besides uh, protection of the, uh, of the landscapes and providing uh, a friendly environment to the birds will equally contribute to more incomes to the producers. In addition to organic certification, the stakeholder event that we held and also the awareness creation that we are, you, uh, we are making. We have also established community-based nursery beds so that we can, one, increase the tree population and also to build local capacities so that in case, for example, this program ended, the local communities should have and should have the urge and should have the knowledge to establish their own nursery beds and has carry on the message and carry on the skills that we, they will have earned through the training sessions that we've offered to them to practice agroforestry. And also to make sure that for the farmers that have not yet attained the minimum standard, which is 40% canopy, can be able to, over time, start to up, uh, upgrade their farms in terms of having trees, that are of diverse species, but also that can offer canopy that's up to 40%. And here I come to the end of my presentation. Thank you very much for listening to us.
we will be waiting for any questions. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Lazarus, really interesting. Um, so if, does anybody have any, any questions? I think I've got, my question actually relates to an event that we did last Thursday. So we heard from a client, a climate scientist from the University of Ghana last week, um, and he was suggesting that all of the different certifications, um, they, they're basically, um, they make life a lot harder for farmers. Now, obviously, your farmers are fair trade and organic and working towards bird friendly. Um, do you feel that extra certification is, is too much effort for the farmers or do they, do they like um, any more certifications? Yes, I, I think first and foremost, Indeed, for you to get these certifications, there's an effort you have to put in. But in terms of uh, the long-term benefits, yes, it's worth the investment because uh, we've, all, we've seen situations where, for example, uh, farmers in Ghana earning less money because they are using chemicals as compared to the farmers in Uganda. Actually, we've gotten visitors who've come and say, how come your farmers in Uganda don't complain about prices like those in Ghana? We know where the secret lies. The secret lies in the fact that the producers, for example, those that are producing coffee here or producing cocoa here, are uh, by default organic, but also they pride in being organic because they know that at the end of the day, them being smallholder farmers, the use of uh, synthetic chemicals is in the short run, yes, commercially viable, but in the long run, there is that dependency that comes with it. And also when you look at, for example, uh, the use of GMOs, it, there's a reliance that you would have to conform to because the breeders must keep giving you new seedlings or new seeds season in, season out. And these come with uh, uh, changes in terms of like adaptation, pest and disease resistance. Our farmers are not complaining yet because they are enjoying, they are reaping the benefits in terms of environmental benefits, in terms of uh, the high incomes, but also in terms of the premiums. For example, we've seen the cocoa cooperative start to become self-reliant and they are now starting to uh, self-run projects. Like for example, recently, they've acquired a piece of land out of the premiums. They've been supporting food security projects where they get uh, seedlings and uh, uh, for example, food, food seed like cassava seedlings, cuttings, and they distribute to their farmers. They've also been able to pay their workers in terms of uh, salary using the premium. So it, it, I, th I think it's how you look at it. Uh, it Yes, indeed, it requires a lot of effort, but once you start to appreciate the effort and why the investment environmentally, it still becomes uh, something that's quite important for them in terms of the long-term benefits. Yeah, that's great. Um, so Shashi, I wanted to bring you in just with a question about the, um, your, the cocoa farmers that live obviously adjacent to the rainforest. Mm -hmm. this, this event we've called it sort of for people and planet. Do you feel that there's ever any tension between the, the farmers wanting to sort of do their own thing and being next to a, a protected area? Do you feel that, the, the, um, that they might want to do something that, uh, that wouldn't necessarily be in the interests of the, um, the, the forest life and the bird life? Um, yes, definitely. That is a uh, that is um, uh, you know it is a challenge that we we face certainly. Um, I think you will find with a lot of uh, local communities that live adjacent to national parks and other protected areas, they they have a history of depending on these on the resources of the national park, the forested area close to them, for a lot of their 
basic needs, yeah? I mean, they go into the forest to collect timber for building their houses, for example. Um, they, you know, they depend on the forest for their daily food, you know, different forest products that they use in their food. And, you know, and once the national park or the protected area is established, then their use of the of some of the products uh, from the forest is restricted. So as part of the Red Plus program that we have, um, that has been running for a few years now in West Africa or in Sierra Leone, um, part of the Red Plus program requires the organization GRC to look after the livelihoods of the local communities nearby. So our, our program looks to establish alternative livelihoods for the local communities so that they become less reliant on the resources within the national park and they become, you know, they adopt practices that are more friendly and sustainable sustainable for the long-term existence of the national park. And that's why, you know, the cocoa, the, the forest-friendly uh, cocoa that we are, the program that we are, you know, running in with the local communities in the area is so important because it helps them to earn a livelihood at the same time, you know, helps them to help protect the national park as well. So, there is, there will always be this tension, but I think we need to find that sweet spot, you know, that we've been talking about. Yeah, certainly. Um, another question that came up, Lazarus, when I was um, watching your presentation, uh, you talked about the two cooperatives that you work with, and one of them hasn't yet managed to export. So, um, is there is there a market for your locally grown for coffee in Uganda? Are people buying it there? Oh, yes, uh, so maybe if I would uh, uh, make it more clear, uh, what they haven't exported is certif organic certified coffee. But the coffees they've been producing through the efforts of uh, Renzori Sustainable Trade Center, they are still able to export it, but they haven't exported it as organic certified coffee. Yes, we are starting to see uh, local consumption of coffee grow but it's a, a developing market. It's not yet commercially viable for the cooperative to produce to sell locally. So all the coffee is exported. So it's not sold on sort of organic fair trade, bird friendly terms. So presumably you would get a sort of market price for that rather than the, uh, the premiums that come with the certifications. Yes. Yeah, so that's that's where it's really important that we're choosing fair trade and in, uh, in, in the UK and beyond. Um, and Shashi, you mentioned that that you you they are actually producing chocolate for consumption in in Sierra Leone. How how's that going? <laughs> yeah, so this is something that's just been started. We had a pilot um, a few years ago with a, a project that we had, and um, the the tricky bit about local. Um, chocolate production is that uh, in order for the chocolate to be brought to the United to the United Kingdom or to Europe for, for that matter, it will have to satisfy quite stringent um, food security uh, regulations. And so it, it, it will be very difficult to, uh, to import um, chocolate that's made in Sierra Leone or in other parts of West Africa into Europe and, and, the, Euro and the American markets. And I think for that reason, if we are to be producing uh, chocolate bars in Sierra Leone, it will have to be for the local market. And in Liberia, we have, um, we, we know of uh, craft chocolate bars that are being produced for the um, expat market in Liberia, but somehow in Sierra Leone, we don't have uh, as big a, a market as, as, as big an expat community that looks to, to get uh, these kinds of chocolate bars. So it's an area of work that's developing and we are learning as we go along. Um, but maybe look out for orange flavored Gola chocolate bars from Sierra Leone in the future. You never know. Yes, indeed. I think, well, because I'm, I'm going to Ghana next week and one of the things I'll be looking into is what's uh, the, the chocolate that's available in you're made in Ghana for, for, for Ghanaians to enjoy. Um, and yeah, there, there's definitely a market for it in West Africa, but it's a, it's a slightly different product. Um, 
Yeah. So what? Uh, so Lazarus, what? What next? What's What's the uh, What's the future for uh, for the Ruwenzori coffee farmers? Yeah, I think the future is really bright uh, because uh, first and foremost, we've seen uh, government, the government of Uganda, come on board to support coffee growing, and with the efforts now that we are putting in to make sure that we are creating micro climates that are specifically adaptable to coffee growing. And we are also training the farmers. We, and then also RSTC is doing a lot of efforts in terms of doing market linkages, making sure that the coffees that the producers have on their farms, one is paid on delivery, so they don't have to wait. And RSTC is doing a good job on that to find pre-finance to make sure that the farmers are paid on delivery, but also to we, the fact that uh, this, these, there are other social projects that are coming on board like village saving and lending associations. We are also seeing the women do crafts uh, because they, most of the times coffee is a more of like a male uh, crop. So the women are brought on board to also have their own income by making sure they are weaving crafts and these crafts are also exported. So the, really I can, what I can say is that the future for coffee growing in Uganda is bright because government is distributing free seedlings. Uh, we've seen our own farmers, especially the ones in Buka, uh, start to multiply their own seedlings with the certification of government which already is an indication that they still want to expand the acreage because they are earning money and they are earning a, a, a living from growing coffee. But also with the new um, efforts to promote local consumption, farmers are starting to appreciate coffee as a beverage they previously used not to. And so we are starting to see all these come in to play a role. And we think production of coffee, yes, is going to increase, but also too, we are going to see the farmers earning more from their coffee because Uganda is starting to be flagged also on the international market as one coffee destination. So these are all positive steps that we think surely will have to certainly make the producers grow more coffee. Yes, and, and obviously the more, the more they grow and the more they sell on yes. fair trade, yes organic certified terms and the the, uh, the brighter the and the brighter it looks uh, that's that, that's really really positive it's so nice to have some some good news um shashi what's um what's next for the the goal the rainforest project where where are the farmers going with it next so i think i i said that in my presentation i'll just say it again um so the first thing we want to do is we want to so there are seven chiefdoms involved in the whole of the greater goal at uh, the uh, gola in sierra leone and we at the moment we work with uh, three or four chiefdoms um in the area so what we'd really like to do is to expand the whole cocoa program to cover all of the seven chiefdoms and we think that if we do that we would get about three thousand farmers on board um, involved in the in the farmer associations. So that's something that obviously will require a lot of um, awareness raising. Um, it will require a lot of distribution of, you know, equipment for the farmers to, to ensure that they can actually rehabilitate their farms. Um, and also then the su support through buying capital and export to the international markets. It, it's, it's quite a lot of work. Um, the second thing that we want to do is really to define what we mean by uh, forest-friendly cocoa. Obviously, uh, because we are dealing with farmers that live so close to the national park, um, we, want to, we want them to be supportive of the activities in the national park. And we want to tell the story of how these farmers are helping us with you know, biodiversity conservation. And I think through, the, through that, you know, to appreciate that these, these far cocoa farmers are producing cocoa under quite different circumstances, you know, not, clear for, not clearing forests for their livelihoods, but you know, helping to support these biodiversity conservation efforts, and at the same time to use methods that could help to improve their livelihoods. And I think that's the story that we want to get out um, 
you know, from, from Gola. Thirdly, we'd like to uh, promote this, this idea of forest-friendly cocoa to other parts, to the uh, to, across the border to Liberia, where we are already starting to work with cocoa farmers, um, and the other landscapes in in Africa that we where we work, you know, and also I mean I I also work in Indonesia, so to also bring this sort of concept of forest-friendly commodities, uh, conservation enterprises in other parts of the world where we work. So that's very, a lot yeah. of work. It's going to keep us busy. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, it never, never ends, but it's uh, definitely worthwhile. And of course, Indonesia, it's very much needed in terms of the palm oil um, plantations. Correct. Um, yeah. Yeah. You know, uh, um, so to, we're coming towards the end, but one uh, one of the people I do want to bring in, if we can, is Pauline, um, who, who's involved in the um, Ruendori uh, project. And uh, I think Pauline, you, uh, do you want to tell us a little bit about what, what your role is in, in promoting the coffee that's that's grown? Uh, yes. Oops, I'm just turning my camera on. Hello, it's a bit dark where I am, but anyway. So I'm the chair of the um, Renzori Sustainable Trade Centre and have worked with Lazarus and Peter and the farmers for many, many years. And um, I'd like to pick up something that I've been doing in the last year to complement the on the ground effort, which is we've started an initiative in partnership with the uh, Scottish Fair Trade Forum, where we're making connections directly between cooperatives like Buka and some of the other cooperatives that produce coffee um, in the Renzori's. Um, that are working with the Renzori Sustainable Trade Centre. And we're connecting them directly with independent roasters and independent cafes in different parts of the UK. And so the good news here is that we have been generating and we have real interest to buy Buka's organic coffee for this season. So by next spring, um, at least in some regions of the UK, there will be Buka organic and nearly bird friendly, hopefully bird friendly certified by them, uh, coffee in the UK. And, um, you know, we're, we're very proud of that. And we're finding that the, that sector, which isn't sort of mainstream high street chains, but tend to be um, really passionate businessmen and women around the UK who really care about um, social and environmental values, as well as really appreciating quality and the stories of farmers. Um, we're, we're finding a lot of interest in this. So I think all that patient work over many, many years of Lazarus and Peter and the farmers um, is gonna come you know, right into the, the, the UK and there'll be a lot more storytelling and a lot more people who can participate in both the challenges and the successes of the groups. So um, this, you can find a bit more information on that. We have a website and the initiative is called the Alternative Coffee Cocoa Company. So you can find under the Alternative Coffee Co and uh, watch this space. <laughs> it's all very exciting. And of course, there's no point farmers um, farming cocoa and coffee if we don't have customers to buy it. So the most important thing, as always, every every time we do a third round trade event, the most important thing is to just get out there, get telling people why it's important to buy fair trade, the difference that it makes. So you've listened to stories from um, from Sierra Leone and from Uganda. You you you've understood um, the importance that that fair trade and um, organic makes to a, a farmer um, and so hopefully you'll be able to go out there into your communities um, and explain really well now um, the importance of the, to the individual farmers and their and their families and how important it is to, for us to continue to buy fair trade. Um, so thank you everybody for coming um, along. Thank you in particular to Shashi and Lazarus and Peter and Pauline as well um, for, for joining us and, and sharing um, uh, the, this, the recording of this will be up on YouTube tomorrow. Um, I've also uploaded the recording of last week's event with uh, Dr. Bob Manteo from the uh, University of Ghana. Uh, the two very different events, so it's definitely worth you watching them both. Um, and what I'll do is I will forward you a link to the presentations that we've seen today.
today so that you've got them um, to, to reference in future. Um, so enjoy the rest of Great Big Green Week because it uh, finishes on Sunday and hopefully you've all been planting your seeds. <laughs> Thanks very much. Thank you. That was Thank terrific. You. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.